Good afternoon. Seeing we're at the top of the hour, um, I'd just like to welcome those of you who have registered and are attending our Western Financial and BC Hotel Association Risk Management Seminar. Uh, seeing that it is just the top of the hour and some people are still signing in, we'll just give a moment or two before we start. Um, and during that time, I'll just do a little bit of housekeeping. Uh, my name is Ingrid Jarrett. I'm President and CEO of the BC Hotel Association, and I'm joined today uh, with our insurance expert and advisor, Rudy Penner. Rudy, I'd like to thank you very much for joining us and, and sharing your wisdom and expertise with us today on this very important topic. Thank you. Now, I will uh, say that this webinar is being recorded and it will be made available uh, after the webinar presentation today. It will rest on the BCHA website and we will also disseminate it with our communique to our industry so that you can use it as a tool for your teams and ensure that if you have any questions following the webinar, uh, please do reach out to us directly and uh, we'll be happy to uh, pass along your questions to Rudy or do our best to answer them. So thank you again for joining us today. Uh, again, uh, welcome. Uh, this webinar is being hosted with BC Hotel Association and Western Financial Group, which is our partner in the insur pooled insurance program, along with the Canadian Hotel and Lodging Association. So Rudy, uh, without further ado, let me uh, pass the uh, mic over to you. And uh, please do go ahead and um, start off the uh, webinar today. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, Ingrid. Um, nice to uh, be here uh, virtually. Um, it's always fun to do these uh, um, in person, but uh, obviously uh, with the things the way they are, um, we will uh, proceed to do this virtually. And uh, again, I'm very pleased to um, be able to be with you today and present uh, um, I'll call it risk management webinar. Um, we're going to discuss two topics today. Um, first one being a commercial kitchens, uh, talk a little bit about those. And the second one is on uh, portable fire extinguishers. So um, without further ado, we'll get right into the commercial kitchens. Uh, so some of the topics that we'll be touching on here today is the principles of commercial cooking, some of the cooking fuels that are used in different uh, types of appliances, uh, the different types of appliances that are available in commercial kitchens, uh, fire extinguishing, uh, fire protection requirements, as well as some apl applicable codes and standards. I will also be talking a little bit about the e exhaust ducts and the work around uh, the, um, the hoods of the uh, commercial kitchens. Um, I'm also going to touch briefly on what I call the altern alternatives. Um, so we'll talk about those a little bit later. Um, but in, these, in this image that you can hopefully see on your screen um, is you know, a typical kitchen line on the left and on the right is some of the uh, um, fire extinguishing uh, systems that are required in a commercial kitchen. So we'll get well into detail with those in a moment. Um, commercial kitchen fires are a significant part of the fire claims that insurance companies process. Uh, the majority of kitchen fires are a result of, you know, either poor construction and installation, poor maintenance practices, um, and that speaks a lot to um, the kitchen fires that we see are mainly due to um, maintenance practices that have um, sort of gone to, um, you know, less than, than desirable. Kitchen fires tend to start when flare-ups, uh, whether that is human or equipment error, ignite the grease residues on the filters in the hood. Uh, these are just some images uh, to show you what a devastating impact kitchen fires can have on not only the building, uh, the people, but also the livelihoods of restaurant owners and hotel owners where these kitchens may be situated. Canadian national statistics have not been compiled since 2002, but uh, however, in 2002, there were 832 fires reported in eating and drinking establishments, causing approximately $48.5 million in damage, along with 42 injuries. According to the NFPA um, survey between 2004 and 2008 in the US, 
there was 229 million in property damage resulting from fires in eating and, um, in eating and drinking establishments. 38% of those fires started from cooking equipment. Um, and those are only the reported numbers. Uh, there is strong indication that the amount of unreported fires could potentially potentially be gr much greater than the reported fires and a disproportionate number of those fires do start in the kitchen. Uh, commercial kitchen uh, ventilation um, is defined as the properly designed and balanced air removal, which is your exhaust and the return makeup system over commercial cooking equipment. Because combustible grease vapors condense and accumulate within the exhaust system, it is necessary for that section of the commercial kitchen ventilation system to be constructed and installed in a way to withstand the possibility of internal fire. Uh, cooking fuels uh, can include things such as gas, uh, electric systems, or even solid fuels. The type of fuel depends largely on the type of food product being cooked. For example, solid fuel is often used to charbroil uh, various kinds of meats. Uh, gas fuel deep fryers are used to cook high volume um, high volume and grease producing foods such as french fries or fish or wings. The severity of these uh, grease buildup depend on the type of food. So frozen food contains a lot of ice, which is a lot of moisture. Um, so that uh, will um, build up more grease as well. The temperature of the appliance and the type of fuel being used. Some of the appliances that we generally come across in commercial kitchens include such things as ovens, grills, griddles, deep fat fryers, stove range, um, charbroilers, salamanders, um, woks, rotisseries, uh, deep fat fryers. Um, as mentioned in the previous slide, the type of appliance usually corresponds to the amount of grease buildup. Charbroilers used to cook meats cause ash to mix with the grease, leading to an unusually large volume of buildup. Deep frying foods with a large amount of water in them leads to a shiny hard buildup that is translucent like creosote. And woks, just by their pure nature, create a grease that is very sticky and syrup-like, and syrup uh, similar in consistency to such something like honey or molasses. Uh, hoods are the most visible component of the commercial kitchen ventilation system. Their job is to capture the heat and effluence and act as the primary filtration system. The size and make depend on the number and type of appliances being used. Uh, so any grease producing equipment must be situated under a hood. So whether that's uh, deep fat fryers, griddles, um, flat tops, whatever it is, anything that produces um, grease laden vapors um, must be situated under a hood. Uh, the hood will also contain baffle filters, as you can see in the picture there, um, and that can be removed for cleaning purposes. These should be cleaned on a daily basis. Uh, this is also where the exhaust cleaning sticker is usually located from the companies that come in and do the, uh, uh, the cleaning that we'll talk about a little bit later. Uh, the fire extinguishing system that is compatible with the commercial kitchen ventilation must adhere to the following codes and standards. So it must be UL300, uh, which is the underwriter's laboratory, and ULC1254.6, which is the underwriter's laboratory of Canada. As well, it must meet NFA, NFPA 96 and 17A, which is the fire extinguishing requirements under the National Fire Protection Association. The requirements generally include such things as pre-engineered fixed pipe um, fire extinguishing system, which is your primary protection. And then also um, the uh, portable fire extinguishers, which is a secondary protection. Um, in the picture there, you'll see uh, a silver uh, fire extinguisher. Those are class K portable fire extinguishers that must be used in commercial kitchens as well as the wet chemical um, extinguishing system that would come out of the nozzles uh, that are situated inside of the hood. Uh, the code requires the following fire protection. Um, it must be a wet chemical installation. Um, it used to be dry, but dry chemicals no longer approved or used. 
Um, there must be an emergency manual operation, whether that's a pulse station for the wet chemical system. Uh, it must be approved by approved by UL 300 or ULC 1254.6. Systems must be inspected and serviced semi-annually by a certified contractor. Um, and this is usually when we come out and do um, surveys, as we call them, um, on on the commercial kitchens is, is that we're finding that they are usually not done on a semi-annual basis uh, for whatever number of reasons, but um, that is a requirement and that is why we will always make that recommendation to have those serviced on a semi-annual basis. Um, and a class K fire extinguisher, which is compatible with the wet chemical suppression system. Um, there used to be carbon dioxide extinguishers, but these are no longer legal and are, extreme, are extremely dangerous to use on a grease fire, so they are no longer allowed. Um, exhaust ducts. Uh, so these are the welded metal ductwork that carry heat and vapor from the kitchen equipment to the outside. Uh, they must be liquid tight, um, like or grease tight, so that there is nothing that can uh, uh, between the uh, seams get out. Um, it also you know, sort of imagine the drain pipe to your bathtub, how tight that has to be so that there's no water drippage going through the uh, connections and things like that. So the same kind of duct work here in a commercial kitchen. Uh, the exhaust system must also be cleaned by a qualified kind contractor on a semi-annual basis. And again, this is usually one of the most prominent recommendations that we would make when we are seeing commercial kitchens is, is that they're not being cleaned on a semi-annual basis. Uh, so again, we would make that recommendation to have that completed um, in a timely manner. Some of the other questions that we ask when we come out to do a survey um, and we come across a commercial kitchen is, is where, where do they discharge? Is it directly outside? Do they pass through combustible materials? Uh, do they extend through the roof? Are they protected by a fixed extinguishing system? And if so, what is the year of installation? Because again, in the previous one, dry used to be allowed, but now it's only wet chemicals. So depending on the year that it was installed, we can usually determine um, if it's original, um, if it still meets it or not. Are the decks cleaned at least semi-annually? Um, and again, this is something that we would see on the sticker that's usually attached to the hood. And what is the name of the cleaning, uh, the duct cleaning company and the date of last cleaning. Um, and again, that's usually would be on the sticker as well. If there's no sticker, these are the questions that we would need to have answers for. These questions are all, you know, very important to help underwriting make a decision about the risk. Um, I mean, obviously a duct that discharges directly outside is safer and easier to clean than one that extends through the through many parts of the building and then to the roof with multiple elbows and spans and or when that passes through combustible materials so depending how long that span is um, obviously will dictate how much uh, cleaning is involved and how much more difficult it is to clean to remove that grease buildup. Uh, a built-in extinguishing system prevents fire losses and regularly clean ducts are essential in preventing kitchen fires. Uh, a quick note on kitchen cleanliness. Um, obviously, a clean kitchen is a good indication of whether the required maintenance is being done. Um, when we are out doing our surveys um, and we come across a kitchen that is, um, you know, um, less than desirable, uh, we would definitely make that recommendation that we need to have regular cleaning done and. Um, you know, uh, clean kitchen, again, is a uh, direct uh, correlation to uh, the possibility of fire starting in there um, when there's um, all this grease um, in, in the system and possibly on the counters and everywhere else. Um, as I said earlier, a little bit about fire, um, fire alternatives. And again, uh, there are a number of different counter top types of units. Uh, these are classified as self-contained ventless deep fryers. Um, we have come across many of these. Um, they're not all the same. Um, there are some good ones, there are some bad ones. Um, and in order for us to approve their use um, for, for use under the insurance program, 
um, they must meet the two requirements. One, they must have an internal wet chemical extinguishing system. And two, this wet chemical extinguishing system must be serviced on a semi-annual basis by a qualified contractor, just like a regular wet chemical fire extinguishing system in a regular commercial kitchen. Um, on the diagram to the right there, you can see um, it says the Ansel fire suppression system. So that is what they need to have in them. So that's a self-contained uh, wet chemical extinguishing system that's in there. Um, and those are the ones that we will um, approve for use under the insurance program. So now we'll just turn our attention um, to portable fire extinguishers for a little bit. Um, if you have any questions on the commercial kitchens, feel free to, I don't know if they're going through the chat or somewhere, um, and we will just, uh, you know, um, take a look at the questions that you have at the end of the presentation. So feel free to uh, uh, put in your questions um, as we go along. Uh, first, in order to understand how fire extinguishers work, uh, we'll need to know a little bit about fire. Um, so fire triangles usually refer to heat, oxygen, and fuel, um, but really um, most times there's four things that must be present at the time in order to produce fire. So enough oxygen to sustain the combustion, enough heat to raise the material to its ignition temperature, some sort of fuel or combustible material. And then the fourth one is the chemical exothermic reaction that is fire. So oxygen, heat, and fuel, are, as I said, are frequently referred to as the fire triangle. When we add in the fourth element, the chemical reaction, you actually have a fire tetrahedron. Uh, the important thing to remember is removing any one of these four things and you will not have a fire or the fire will extinguish. So all, all of them are required in order for a fire to, um, to burn. Uh, essentially, fire extinguishers put out fire by taking away one or more elements of the fire triangle or tetrahedron. Portable fire extinguishers are, are exactly what its name says. They are movable, not stationary, so they can be moved to a fire. Uh, the size of a fire extinguisher is sometimes expressed in weight or more specifically in pounds. The fire extinguisher's weight indicates how much extinguishing agent it can hold, not the, actually the total weight of the fire extinguishers. So um, when people re refer to, um, the, you know, whether it's a five pound or 10 pound fire extinguisher, it's the amount of extinguishing agent that it can hold, uh, not the true weight of the um, fire extinguisher itself. Uh, there are some limitations to portable fire extinguishers. Um, in order to make them light enough to move around, they are limited in their capacity of extinguishing uh, agent that they would have inside of them. Um, it also then limits the amount of time that you have before they are fully discharged or empty um, because they are only a certain size. And then depending on the type of extinguisher, they may also have a spray range of anywhere from three to 15 feet. Um, which is due to the pressure content. Again, being a small, smaller unit, the pressure content uh, would only allow you to um, get a certain distance uh, of spray from that. Uh, some of the general um, requirements when selecting a portable fire extinguisher um, is you know, the type of fire most likely to occur, to occur, the size of fire most likely to occur, uh, hazards in the area where the fire is most likely to occur, uh, energized electrical equipment in the vicinity of the fire, ambient temperature conditions. So uh, all of these things will come into play when, you know, or should be looked at when you're trying to decide um, on a portable fire extinguisher. Um, portable fire extinguishers, are typically the first line of defense against small fires. Um, if used correctly, you know, at the right time and in the right way, they can save a building life and or livelihood. Uh, so the selection of extinguishers does not depend on whether there is another fire protection in the building. So even if you have um, a sprinkler system in your building, you are still required to have fire extinguishers in the building as well. Um, they are not, uh, dependent on whether there's another protection, they still have to be there. 
there are five classifications of fires. Um, so uh, class A are fires involving materials such as wood, cloth, paper, um, and these are you know, uh, requ required anywhere ordinary combustibles are present. Um, class B uh, fires involving flammable liquids. Uh, so those are things such as gasoline, oil, some paints and solvents, um, and uh, fire extinguishers would be required for locations where there's a potential for flammable liquid fires. Class C, uh, these are fires involving energized electrical equipment. Uh, so these are required in areas where uh, energized electrical equipment may be encountered. Uh, class D is fires involving combustible metals such as magnesium, um, these are be required in areas where there is potential for fire involving combustible metals. And then class K, uh, we just talked briefly about those in the commercial kitchen. So these uh, are fires involving cooking oils that are used in the commercial cooking equipment. Um, and these would be used where there is potential for fires involving combustible cooking components, such as commercial kitchens. Uh, a little bit about the ratings on fire extinguishers. Um, so fire extinguishers for class A, uh, which is the ordinary combustibles, and class B, which is the flammable liquids, uh, come with a rating. Um, so the number in front of A classification is the rating and indicates how much water the extinguisher is equivalent to. So, and represents 1.25 gallons of water for every unit of one. So for an example, um, a 4A rated fire extinguisher would be equal to five gallons of water. So the number in front of the A, the four multiplied by one and a quarter gallons of water for every unit is five. So um, then the number in front of the B classification for the flammable liquids uh, represents the area in square feet of a flammable liquid one inch deep that a non-expert user should be able to extinguish. And it's important here to recognize the word non-expert. Um, uh, those that have been trained in fire um, fighting and those kinds of things um, would be able to do a larger fire, um, but your you know, uh, standard person who has not had that kind of training, uh, the non-expert, um, this is meant for them, these classifications, because that's typically, typically the person that's gonna be using them. So therefore, um, an extinguisher rated as a 10 BC uh, non-expert user should be able to put out a flammable liquid fire that is as large as 10 square feet. Uh, class C, D, and K, uh, these are generally not given any kind of numerical rating. Um, as I said earlier, uh, lots of people refer to fire extinguishers by you know five pound, 10 pound, those kinds of things. So. Um, the weight of the extinguisher is based on the amount of um, extinguishing agent, which is different than its rating. So for if we take, for example, a typical five pound dry chemical fire extinguisher is rated at a 3A40BC. So this means that it can be used for A, B, or C classes of fire. Uh, it means that it has five pounds of agent in the extinguisher, referring to the five pound. Um, the 3A, meaning it's equal to 3.75 gallons of water for you know, the combustible um, fires, which is your paper, wood, those kinds of things. The 40B uh, means a non-expert user should be able to put out a flammable liquid that is as large as 40 square feet. Uh, C, meaning it is non-conductive and acceptable for use for an electrical fire, because uh, C was the uh, class for electrical fires but you'll see there's no number in front of that because uh, those ones usually don't have ratings, as I said earlier. So this type of fire extinguisher is typically called a multi-purpose ABC uh, dry chemical fire extinguisher. These are what we see most commonly in most places, unless there's a specific um, use extinguisher, but these would be your uh, multi-purpose ones that you would uh, have in you know, the hallways of the hotels and those kinds of places. Um, the five pound and possibly the 10 pound are the most common ones found. 
So usually a five pound, as I said, you know, they're rated at 3A40 BC. Those are typically what um, would be found, like I said, in the hallways of the hotels and those kinds of places. Some places that need a little bit bigger ones, um, they may have the uh, the 10 pound, which is the um, usually rated at 4A60 uh, BC. Uh, but again, um, there are larger ones. Um, uh, typically don't see smaller ones other than marine ones, um, but uh, that's a different uh, category by itself. So I didn't get into the marine stuff, but um, there are some that can be bigger than the 10 pound, um, but don't see too many of those um, as a common thing. Some of the uh, common features on a fire extinguisher, um, I think that we all need to, you know, be able to recognize and know what 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 it means. You'll see on the fire extinguisher, there's a locking pin um, with an anti-tamper seal. So basically, once you pull that pin, um, that is what will now engage the fire extinguisher um, to be able to start being used. So if that pin is missing, um, that means that it's been tampered with. Um, so you should probably take a look at, you know, um, having that fire extinguisher looked at. Um, by a um, qualified company. Uh, you'll see the pressure gauge on there. Again, um, you wanna, there's a little needle in there. Um, it'll either, if it's properly charged, um, ready to go, uh, the needle will be in the green part. Um, if it's in the red part, um, it should be looked at by a qualified company um, uh, that deals with fire extinguishers. Uh, Along, you'll see the uh, discharge nozzle or horn, and these can become uh, in different uh, styles. Um, most of them will look like this, but there are some that have like a actual, um, looks like a horn at the end uh, type of thing, um, like a backwards funnel on there type of thing. Uh, it's just different styles. Uh, they'll all have a carry handle on them. Um, and that's because again, they're portable fire extinguishers. So uh, they need to have some way of being able to be moved around. Uh, that is also your operating lever. So when you press down on that, after the pins removed, that will discharge the uh, extinguishing agent inside. They will all come with some kind of label on there. Um, and the label has a couple of different important things on it. Um, It'll tell you what type it is. So whether it's a water type, whether it's a CO2 dry chemical, uh, what the classifications of it are. Uh, so that's where you'll find that on the label. Uh, there's usually an NFPA capacity rating on there. Um, and there'll also be instructions on how it should properly be used. So um, by taking a look at the label, you can get all of this information and be able to, um, uh, you know, make sure that one, it's in working order by showing it in green, that the pin hasn't been removed and those kinds of things um, that are um, important to take a look at on, on a regular basis. Um, so this is an excerpt from the um, Hotel Fire Safety Act. And basically it states that every hotel shall install and maintain portable fire extinguishers of the type and in the number and of such fire extinguishing rating in such manner and location or locations in the hotel as are prescribed by the regulations. So um, right here, you're seeing that, you know, you do need to have portable fire extinguishers located in your hotel, even if you do have a uh, sprinkler system in there or those kinds of things, um, it's right in here. So, you know, there's codes um, and you may say, what, well, what regulations? So the uh, National Fire Code of 2015 uh, says that portable fire extinguishers shall be installed in all buildings except dwelling units. So that's your one and two family dwellings, but all other buildings must have portable fire extinguishers in there. And except as otherwise required by this code, portable extinguishers shall be selected and installed in accordance with NFPA 10, which is the, affordable, the portable fire extinguishers um, um, section. So the, uh, the National Fire Code of Canada 2015 um, has been adopted by BC um, and dictates that the uh, portable fire extinguishers must be selected and installed in accordance with, with NFPA 10. So um, they are working on National Fire Code 2020, but uh, right now 2015 is the latest edition and that's the one that's still being used 
until the other one, 2020, uh, gets final reading and approval. Um, NFA, NFPA 10 uh, regulates the insulation requirements based on the type of hazard and occupancy. So hotels, uh, hotel rooms are considered class A light occupancy hazards. Um, kitchens are class A ordinary occupancy hazards. Um, but if you recall that cooking appliances require a type K uh, fire extinguisher. So these are the uh, uh, NFPA 10 lists out all of the different kinds of occupancies, um, the hazards um, and those kinds of things. And based on that, we'll determine how many fire extinguishers you need, where they should be placed and those kinds of things. But um, so most of the fire extinguishers sh um, should be wall mounted. Um, there are um, two different ways of, um, or requirements under the wall mounting. So if an extinguisher weighs more than 40 pounds, uh, then the top of the extinguisher cannot be more than three and a half feet from the ground. And the bottom of the extinguisher must be at least four inches off the ground. If the extinguisher weighs less than 40 pounds, the top of the extinguisher cannot be more than five feet from the ground. And again, the bottom of the extinguisher must still be at least four inches off the ground. Now, um, in both cases though, um, this includes um, any extinguishers that you may have in cabinets, um, but it does not include the wheeled extinguishers. Um, I haven't seen too many wheeled extinguishers in, in hotel rooms, but um, there are fire extinguishers that are on wheels and they get moved around that way. So these requirements would not uh, pertain to those. Uh, extinguishers should be placed where they are readily accessible in the event of a fire, which typically includes normal paths of travel um, so that they can be seen. If there is visual obstructions that can't be avoided, then arrows, lights, or signs are required to help indicate where a fire extinguisher is located. Uh, the criteria for determining the um, minimum number and the rating of fire extinguishers for a class A fire protection um, is on this table here. So in certain instances, through a fire protection analysis of specific areas, process hazards, or building configurations, fire extinguishers with higher ratings can be required. However, this, is, this does not mean that the recommended maximum travel distance can be exceeded. As you can see, regardless of whether it's light hazard occupancy, ordinary hazard occupancy, or extreme hazard occupancy, um, the different requirements there, but the maximum travel distance to an extinguisher is maintained at 75 feet. It can never go beyond that. Uh, arrangements in a building, uh, the actual placement of fire extinguishers can best be uh, accomplished through a physical survey of the area to be protected. Uh, in general, uh, selected locations should have the following char characteristics. They should provide uniform distribution, provide easy accessibility. Uh, they need to be relatively free from blocking by storage and equipment or, or both. Um, they should be near normal paths of travel. You don't want to have to some, have someone that veers off a long distance out of the normal path of travel to have to go and get a fire extinguisher. Uh, they should be near entrance and exit doors. Uh, they should be free from the potential of physical damage. Um, they should be readily visible and be determined on a floor by floor basis. So um, each floor could have different requirements based on the layouts and things like that. Um, sometimes fire extinguishers are purposely kept nearby when performing certain operations, you know, such as you know, a plumber when they're doing soldering, um, they should have one right by their side um, so that they do not have to leave um, a spark um, to go and get one. They should always have one by their side um, but uh, since a fire outbreak usually cannot be prejudged as to its location, fire extinguishers are um, often strategically placed throughout the areas so that there's always one close by. Um, on travel distances between extinguishers, uh, the code requires at least one 
two A rated extinguisher at a maximum 75 feet travel distance, uh, covering 6,000 square feet for light hazard occupancy. Uh, for ordinary hazard occupancy, which is your kitchen, parking garage, mechanical rooms, or electrical rooms, uh, same travel distance, again, never um, exceeding 75 feet, but one 2A extinguisher per every 3,000 square feet. Um, and then for, for us, when we come out, um, we've taken a stance that, um, you know, Western Financial Group um, for the insurance, we recommend placing an extinguisher a maximum of 50 feet apart covering an area of 2,500 square feet. So basically a 50 foot by 50 foot section, um, there should be a fire extinguisher there. Um, we just think it's important that there is, um, you know, better to have more than have have not far apart, uh, depending on what the situation is. So that's usually what we will look for is to have no more than 50 feet apart and not and being covering it in a 2,500 square foot area. Uh, note that higher rated extinguishers can cover more area, um, but as mentioned, the maximum travel distance cannot be exceeded. So again, the 75 feet is the maximum um, distance that they should be apart. Uh, so there's most two a rated fire extinguishers uh, we see in the field are multi-purpose dry chemical extinguishers, um, but commercial kitchens will require the class A wet chemical fire extinguisher. Uh, so there's a couple of different classifications. Um, the dry chemical extinguisher, which is your class ABC or multi-purpose. Um, these coat fuel with flame retardant. Um, Air pressurized water extinguishers, which are class A only, that's your combustibles. Uh, these work by extinguishing um, or cooling the surface of the fuel. CO2 carbon dioxide extinguishers, uh, they displace oxygen, so that's how they work on that basis. Sodium chloride based or dry powder, uh, these are class D only, so heat from the fire causes it to cake and form a crust, excluding air and dissipating heat from burning metal. Uh, so for the multi-purpose dry chemical uh, or class A fires, uh, they have the additional characteristics of softening and sticking when in contact with hot surface surfaces. So in this way, it adheres to burning materials and forms a coating uh, that smothers and isolates the fuel from air. With chemical extinguishers, um, so basically, you know, they come in uh, two sizes, usually um, uh, a six liter and a 9.46 liter or, um, um, and these work on um, a basis of, you know, a solution of water um, and potassium acetate, potassium carbonate um, or potassium citrate or a combination of these chemicals. The liquid agent typically has a pH of 9.0 or less, um, and the agent works as a coolant. So on class K fires, cooking oil fires, the agent forms a foam blanket um, to prevent reignition, extinguishes by saponification and cooling of cooking oil fires. The water content of the agent aids in cooling and reducing the temperature of the hot oils and fats below their auto ignition point. And then the agent, when discharged as a fine spray directly at the cooking appliances, reduces the possibility of splashing hot grease and does not present a shock hazard to the operator. So, um, because as you've probably all heard, you should never throw water on a grease fire. Um, there is some water in here, um, but that is not what is putting it out. And it comes in at a very um, low rate so as to not uh, create that effect of water on grease. Um, in recent years, the development of high efficiency cooking equipment with high energy input rates and the widespread use of vegetable oils with high auto ignition temperatures has highlighted the need for a new class K uh, fire extinguisher. The wet chemical extinguisher was the first extinguisher to qualify for the new class K requirements. So in addition to offering rapid fire extinguishment, a thick foam blanket is formed to prevent reignition 
while cooling both the appliance and the hot cooking oil. Wet chemical extinguishers also offer improved visibility during firefighting, as well as minimizing cleanup afterward. Uh, a little bit about the service. Uh, annual inspection is required by a qualified contractor. Um, extinguishers should be tagged with the date of last service and the company that did this service and the technician's signet, um, initials on there as well. Um, you should also um, make monthly checks um, on the fire extinguishers and just to ensure that you know things like the pin is still intact, the pressure indicator is in the right area. Those things that we talked about a little bit when we saw the common elements of the fire extinguisher. Uh, so you always want to make sure um, you know at least once a month taking a look and making sure that the pressure is is still in the green, that the pin has not been removed, um, so that when when and if you do need to use that fire extinguisher, um, that it will work and that there should be no issues with that. Um, so if you do, um, just before I move on to this, if you do need to have a list of companies um, that service fire extinguishers in your area, we have been compiling um, a list of companies um, that do um, all sorts of work such as um, fire extinguishers, uh, sprinkler systems, and those kinds of things. Um, we've uh, assembled um, a list um, across Canada so even within BC, if you're in an area and want to know who handles that kind of work, um, feel free to um, let us know and we can provide you some names off of that list as well. Uh, so the last thing I want to talk about is the use of the, um, the fire extinguisher. Um, it's usually you know, work on um, the acronym PASS. So what that uh, stands for is you know, the P is for pull the pin on the fire extinguisher in order to break the tamper seal. Uh, the A is for aim the fire extinguisher low with the nozzle pointed at the base of the fire. Uh, S is squeeze the handle of the fire extinguisher to release the extinguishing agent. And the other S is sweep the nozzle from side to side while pointed at the base of the fire until it's extinguished. Um, that is the simplest way to remember how to, you know, use the fire extinguisher, what you need to do. Um, if the fire does reignite, uh, just repeat the last three steps, um, keeping in mind that you know you will be limited to how much extinguishing agent is in the fire extinguisher based on the size of the fire extinguisher. So you know you just want to make sure that um, you try to control it as much as possible, but always the first uh, you know that is the first line of defense. If the fire gets too large um, for the fire extinguisher to handle. Um, life safety always comes first and uh, you know it should make arrangements to make sure everybody gets out of the building and then uh, call the fire department and have them deal with the fire. Uh, they're trained for that purpose. Uh, just a final comment here um, from Siemens. Um, they do a lot of fire protection in hotels. Um, a hotel is a complex building. Uh, there's uh, diverse demands on the extinguishing infrastructure that has to be provided. You know, what is installed in the hotels is largely determined by, you know, local building codes, uh, some by insurance guidelines, you know, official fire safety reports, and, you know, the size of the property. So all of these uh, things are taken into consideration um, when you're looking at, you know, all of the different uh, fire protection needs within a hotel. That is basically, um, or that is um, what I had uh, prepared for a presentation on this. Um, if you do have any questions, um, I guess I would just say you feel free to open up the, the lines or the chat, uh, however you want to handle that, I'm not sure. Thank you very much, Rudy. Yeah, we do actually have uh, a question here and I'll just read it from the chat sure. and then you can uh, address them as they come in. Is there a checklist available to reduce the risk of an insurance claim? Uh, so I guess, you know, um, reduce an insurance claim as to, you know, checklist for what? Um, I guess, is it a fire claim? Is it a flood claim? I guess, I guess um, maybe I've done that quite catching what the intent of the question was there. Yeah, so, um, it, it, you know, it really is sort of a, a maintenance checklist, I suspect. What they're asking is, you know, how to 
I think the detail that you've provided to the fire would be there. Okay. There would be other for flood, there would be other for different kinds of claims. So yeah. is there uh, you know, a checklist available to make sure that the um, maintenance teams or the kitchen teams or whoever is responsible for the departments okay. uh, can check, uh, have yeah. a checklist that they can use? We have um, a manual, um, it's entitled Risk Management at a Glance for Hotels. Um, it is basically um, uh, nuts to bolts um, with all sorts of different information on different uh, topics and and forms that you can use for that purpose. Um, I believe I believe that should be available to everybody that joins the insurance program. Um, if you do not have one, um, please let us know and we will ensure that we can get one out to you because uh, there's a lot of information in there. And um, like I said, there's forms and things like that that they can uh, use uh, right from, from the start. Rudy, why don't you forward that to us and we will we will send that out with the copy of the webinar okay. uh, to those people that are on our program. Perfect. Here, here's another question for you. What's the best way to come up with a risk management strategy for an RV park with rental cabins and when most areas are actually outside? Yeah, so um, I guess what we've done or what they've, what the provincial government has done here in Manitoba is, um, you know, there's all sorts of fire bans. So, you know, um, controlling some of these things that you can control by not allowing, you know, to have fires um, in uh, during certain periods of time, like when it's really dry and that's sort of what's happening with all the uh, um, wildfires that are happening. I think some of those are just been sparked by um, those kinds of things as well. So, you know, um, being diligent with, with those kinds of things, uh, storing combustibles against things such as wood and those kinds of things away from, um, the cabins and those kinds of things. So there is a number of different, you know, just don't want to use the word common sense approach, but basically, yeah, you know, if taking a look and going through and saying, what are my exposures here? So if I'm have a pile of wood, that is an exposure to, you know, um, making a fire larger, you know, or, you know, causing having a fire start there if the other elements are present as well. Um, so, you know, doing a checklist of going around and just seeing, you know, what can cause me concern here? What are the things that, you know, could um, potentially cause something to happen? And then, you know, just how am I going to deal with that? So, you know, can I move this wood pile further away? Can I, you know, um, should I have an extinguisher inside each of the cabins? Absolutely. Those are things that can be done and just, you know, going through that process and reviewing that process on a continual basis because things will change, you know, um, weekly, even monthly or yearly type of thing. Those kinds of things will change. Yeah, I suspect, Rudy, that list or that document or those documents that you referred to earlier. Yeah, there's probably going to be some stuff in there that they can definitely use as well right off Great. the hop, yeah. Yeah, yeah. And again, we'll make sure that we share that uh, yeah. with, with the people on the uh, webinar today as well as some... Um, the other uh, hotel members that are on the program. Uh, I'm not seeing any more questions. May I just ask Rudy, do you have any final comments today? Uh, just uh, again, it's been a pleasure um, being able to provide this to you. Um, um, I know um, we'd like to do, you know, possibly more of these kinds of things, but what I would ask is, is, you know, if there's anything that you really are interested in or um, your membership is interested in, let us know um, because there's a couple of things that, like I said, this risk management at a glance, we're continually looking at updating that. So if there's information in there that we haven't thought about or something that comes across from your members that we could you know address and then put that into there as well. We're always looking for, you know, for suggestions on things like that to improve that. Um, we're looking at, you know, um, again, uh, what are some of the things that, you know, keep you up at night? You know, is it something that, you know, we can handle from a risk management perspective um, and uh, create loss prevention bulletins for you uh, for those kinds of purposes? So, you know, um, we just, sometimes it's difficult when you're in doing this kind of thing um, to think about, you know, what are they missing? But, you know, 
So if we can get feedback back as to, you know, perhaps some of the things that you'd be looking for, that your members are looking for to, you know, help um, create more content, um, we're always willing to do that. Um, and we love working with, uh, with you. Um, I've had nothing but, you know, my guys, when they go out to do these surveys, um, always, you know, come back with uh, the positive um, comments about, you know, the places that they've seen. So we, we look forward to continuing that as well. Great. Well, thank you very much, Rudy. And um, I see on the final slide, there is contact information, but I will let those of you on the webinar to reach out to Mike at bcha.com and we'll ensure that we pass along any questions that you may have that have not been answered today or yeah. any requests for additional information on how to mitigate insurance costs and claims. So thank you again, Rudy. It's a pleasure to work with you as always. Uh, be safe in the rest of the summer and uh, we look forward to continuing to work together. Thank you so much. Thank you, Ingrid. Same to you.